out here at the Winter Camping Symposium and I just caught a great presentation from Glenn Hooper who is uh, from Northwestern Ontario and is one of the writers for wintertracking.com. Um, one thing that I caught in his presentation that I really wanted to share with you all is uh, um, the, the planning that needs to go in before you really go out on some of these trips across uh, ice because it's not always safe and um, you need to have a lot of forethought and uh, make sure you've tested your gear out and find something that's going to work for you. So uh, what Glenn has here is a pack that he carries on his person. Even if he's pulling a sled, he has his pack on his person. Why do you do that? Uh, yeah, it's a good question because a lot of people do not like to carry a little a backpack on them because you will get sweat on your back and, and every bit of uh, perspiration and moisture in your clothing is an issue. You can, you can compensate with uh, wool clothing because it's just so good even when it's frosty. Uh, but, but my theory is that, uh, if, well, if I'm a hauling a sled especially and I go through, uh, I might not be able to recover my sled with all. So if I have all my survival gear on my sled, I, I might I'm, I might be in trouble if I go through and that sled goes through. My sled will float, okay. it, uh, but it uh, I may not be able to retrieve it. So I want everything uh, that I need, absolutely 100% to save myself on my person. Right. Um, now I also do. I'm also day tripping with just a, a backcountry skiing or snowshoeing with the base camp left behind. So I haven't got the sled, so by default I have to have it on the pack. Okay. Yeah. Um, aside from the pack, what do you carry just like right on you that you that you kind of use for? Right, yeah. so the, um, uh, I've, I've got matches and lighter, which everybody should have on them, and I've got them. Um, this isn't my winter trekking gear, obviously, but I'll, I'll have it in accessible pockets close to the surface that uh, are secure uh, from, uh, they're not an open pocket, so if you're in the water, things can float away and you're thrashing around and pulling yourself up on the ice with your ice picks. So um, uh, you need uh, matches and lighter, knife should be on you, um, uh, ice picks which are, uh, uh, these are homemade model here. Okay, what'd you make those out of? I made uh, these out of hockey sticks okay. and uh, galvanized Ardox nails that are, um, these are epoxied in. And you always have your your ice picks on you when you're out on the ice. So this is a piece of gear that uh, that uh, is essential for helping to pull you pull you out. So it and goes without saying that that you would have these on. Right. And when he means on you, he means physically like this on you, not in your pack, not in your pockets. It needs to be readily available to right. uh, to use if right. You, you, you have to be able to. You're going to be immersed in water. You're going to be holding yourself up with your arms, and you need these will float. And there's there's excellent commercial models that are, are probably even better than these. But it, it has to be right there so you can grab it and you're deploying. You can't be fumbling in pockets. It's gotta be right there. Okay. Yeah. Good. So that's, uh, so that's to extricate yourself. I mentioned matches and lighter in pockets, but chances are they won't work because um, first of all, you're, you, you can count, if it's really cold, you can count on your, your hands being dysfunctional. You're gonna have two frozen fists where you can barely do anything. So, um, although this is always on my person, like a butane lighter and, and waterproof matches, I, I doubt I'd have the dexterity to even do this. And if it's windy, where I gotta make my fire, the, the, and butane may not volatilize, and so this may not be functional, and my match case is gonna be soaking wet. Um, you, I could put a striker in here, but handling that with wet, frozen hands is a bit difficult. Right. So another, another thing that, um, I carry as lanyard to my person is a windproof lighter okay. like this. It's windproof in quotations because, right. and this this particular one has a, an O-ring seal on it. Um, so, and I've tested this submerged in water. The, the marketing says it's waterproof, um, but it everything's uh, can can fail. Yeah. It unlike a flint wheel, this has a, a push button piezo ignition mechanism. So with frozen hands, even even doing something like like this, I, I can do it and I can hold this. It's not totally windproof, uh -huh. but this is a mechanical device that can fail. And if water gets into the, the piezo system, it can fail, so I'm not counting on this. This would be my first go-to because it's so easy, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I'm not counting on it. And it's lanyarded it to me, and I can, I can quick release it if I want to. Okay. Uh, but, uh, so I gotta make a fire. I, uh, I, if that doesn't work, I've also got a good old uh, ferro rod with me, okay. and it's, it's lanyard to my person as well. And this might actually be 
the key life saving device because if if I can't get the matches to work and the lighters to work, I'm gonna have to find a fine tinder. I'm gonna have to have that on me so I can even with um, frozen hands. Um, I I think I can I can I can work this. Okay. And so that that leads me to the uh, a work in progress that I'm 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 calling the must make fire kit. So in in uh, my backpack I've got things like uh, a fleece in a dry bag and 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 dry socks, Gore-Tex socks because I have if I travel back to a base camp uh, with frozen boots I can change into dry socks against the skin stuff like standard stuff like that, all your basic stuff. But the must make fire kit I want it to be small and light. I don't want to carry lots of fuel with me, and this this can be clipped. Uh, this is, this is the actual pack I use another pack, and it's got a a quick click. Uh, quick release clip on the side so this is always available and I've got I've been working on a number of concepts here uh, including um, what are called the the storm proof matches these are these these big uh, robust matches um, but as this is right from the store and I just got this a couple weeks ago so I'm, I'm still thinking this through uh -huh. um, what are your concerns well my concerns are that uh, with frozen hands um, I, I, I've lost just about all dexterity, even dexterity to maybe even grab something and pull it out. Uh -huh. um, it comes stock with a padding in the top uh, to protect the, the tops of these and a striker on the outside. It also comes with a spare striker in plastic in here. Uh -huh. um, if you can get these matches going, if you had a pile of tinder, they would for sure ignite it. Okay. But I don't think I can get that out of the plastic with, with frozen hands. Right. So, and this could be frozen and covered in ice, because I'm uh, if I'm out at minus 20, minus 30, everything's going to be, I'm in the water, as soon as I get out, everything will instantly flash freeze. So I've been thinking about how can I cover that, it's it's problematic, especially to undo. Yeah. Uh, one of the fellows in the seminar today suggested turning these upside down and putting the striker in here so that you could strike it. Again, it's kind of fiddly with frozen hands. Mm -hmm. but. Um, I want some redundancy in the kit, and like I said, I'm, this is a work in progress. I've got your standard cotton ball type Vaseline tinder, okay. and, and I think... And you just rolled uh, the cotton balls in Vaseline for that? Yeah, actually these, these ones are, uh, are dry in a plastic bag, and I just stuck it in there. This plastic bag could breach, and it could also be hard to get out, but I've got some, yep. I've got some uh, waxed, or sorry, uh, uh, Vaseline cotton balls in, oh, okay. in 35 millimeter containers. Yep. The rubber on the on uh, Ranger band, like a cut uh, bicycle inner tube, or the rubber bands, can are also good burnables yep. once you get a fire going. And I can get this off with frozen hands and my teeth. Right, right. Um, so that's that's sort of standard. Uh, lots of information out there in books and on the internet. And but I still have to fluff them. Okay. To for the ferro rod to ignite. Right. And but I figure I, I could probably do that. Okay. Um, but you never know. Uh, I've got some wax jute twine here, which is good tinder when you have hands that work for, for a ferro rod or matches or whatever. Uh -huh. uh, but you need to fluff it. Okay. And I won't be able to fluff it, but it's just I just had it laying around, threw it in the kit. You never know. Uh, be, but once I get the fire going, oh, this will be this is excellent burnable fuel because of the wax. It'll burn for a while and give me time to gather other other wood if it's desperate. Uh, just some more. Uh, these are actually, this is Vaseline uh, cotton balls coated with beeswax. Okay. So uh, if, if, if the water gets in, mm -hmm. um, these are in theory waterproof. Okay. Okay. I've got, uh, now one of the things, um, it may take some, oh, one more, uh, one more fire starter that, that can work with the, the ferro rod. It, it, our, uh, what are called gel wax cotton balls here. So I got them in a bag here because they kind of shed a little bit of grease. I need a better, um, a better containment system. Uh -huh. These are these are waterproof as is. And where do you get this gel from? Or uh, what is it? Gel wax is is uh, it looks like clear jello. Okay. Uh, and it's it's a it's a, another type of material instead of wax that they make uh, the candle makers use. Okay. So if you look for it online, they generally sell it in bulk, like in big uh, uh, tubs of. Uh, a couple liters or quarts or something. Okay. And it's not too expensive. Uh -huh. With these, you you have to break them open, and and a knife is one technique. 
Okay. Um, it's actually so tough. This this it's kind of rubbery. Feel that? Eh? Oh yeah, it is very rubbery. Um, I might not be able to tear it with yep. this, mm -hmm. but I figure I can do it with my teeth. Mine open there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Uh, but I need a better, a better. Now, uh, is this gel just a waterproofing, or does it also burn? Well, it's yes. That's the key to this this piece of uh, technology we call it. Uh, um, once that cotton is exposed and, and ignites, the cotton will form a wick, and this uh, will burn. It can, you can, this will burn on water really? and in snow. Really. And it, it can actually it'll stay ignited and it can actually burn down snow. So this is an excellent base right. to buy me some time. Uh, I, I, I don't want to be using elite bushcrafting techniques. I can't, I can't afford that with frozen hands and I'm, I'm going to die soon. So I've got to have must make fire. I have thought of uh, bottles of little vials of alcohol, uh -huh. um, but elk, it's too, it, doesn't, it doesn't vaporize. It, it doesn't work. Kerosene is another option, which I haven't tried, but the problem with kerosene is it leaks in your pack. Mm -hmm. It's a real mess. So I want to stay away from liquids. Uh, especially with frozen hands, getting them open. I don't right. want to be Drinking opening Nalgene with my teeth or, and getting kerosene in my mouth. Right. So, uh, now one thing that I'm missing, uh, oh, oh, actually a couple more things. I've got cards of birch bark oh, that okay. fit into the slots of this little pouch. Yeah. So these, uh, once I get a fine tinder going, these will produce some real BTUs real quick yep. if, I, if I don't have uh, the luxury of a lot of black spruce twigs or things that are really ignitable. So this this will help get it going. And one of the things I haven't gone in here yet is small pieces of fat wood. I have enough room so far with this stuff to put some sticks of fat wood. So that could actually be my preliminary fuel or those uh, waxed impregnated sawdust yep. sticks that you can mm -hmm. get at the hardware store. Mm -hmm. um, and there's room for about four of them in the kit here so far. Cool. And I could actually get a fire going that's that'll all fit in here with a little bit of fuel and that that uh, buys me some time. But ultimately I'm gonna need a huge fire to dry out. The other, or the other option is to do a totally cold self-rescue and uh, um, with your sleeping bag and a bivy bag, which I recommend people carry in the winter, you can uh, get that off of your sled if your hands can work, if you've retrieved your sled if the zippers on your duffels aren't frozen, so you gotta think of your fastening system on your sled. If it's all buried and encased in ice, ice it's gonna be hard. Um, but if you can get that, you can, you can take off your wet clothes, crawl in, or crawl in with your wet clothes, and uh, warm up, recover, uh, get the warmth back in your extremities, and then dash out of there, and then work on a fire, uh, work on a fire your, your shelter, or whatever. This is great. Uh, this is one thing that really, if you're going to be doing a lot of winter camping or any winter camping or even day trips on the water, you need to start thinking of these types of things. Um, it really can make a huge difference in your survival rate if you do happen to go through the water. And um, you were talking about uh, the time, if you do go through the water, what's the first thing you need to stop and think about? Right, there's, there's actually been um, uh, a lot of uh, high-end scientific research on this. Uh, some of the best is uh, from Dr. Giesbrook in uh, University of Man uh, Manitoba. And uh, uh, the, the rule of thumb is uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so within 10 minutes, you should uh, get yourself out. Now you can last up to one hour, even two hours, but you're gonna be in really bad shape. And, and, and it's actually, uh, 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 you're tougher than you think. The water is only, so to speak, at, at freezing that your body is immersed in. The, Things really get bad when you get out right. with wind chill and everything, and then there's you've got it. You've got to um, you've got to deal with with uh, flash freezing clothes, dysfunctional hands, and and other uh, other problems. Um, but uh, you don't have to get yourself out within the first couple seconds. Okay, uh, it's probably better to to uh, well the the most important thing is to control your breathing. They say now this is what I'm reading. I'm not an expert on this, but I've done the reading on it. The, the single biggest risk is drowning. Yeah. And people with their gas reflex in the cold water, they they uh, aspirate some water mm -hmm. and they drown. So the first thing is to control your breathing, um, support yourself on the ice, and then probably spend a, a couple seconds thinking, oh yeah, I got my ice picked. Well, actually, the, the more you've trained, mm -hmm. the more you've thought about it, the less time you should require for thinking. Right. It's just like everything, yeah. right? If you've, if you've trained yourself on this and think about it a lot, you should go into autopilot and start to uh, use your skills to, to get yourself out. But you don't have to get out in those first few seconds. You may need need to do uh, 
some, you may need to regain your composure and control your gas reflex because it's going to be quite a shock. Right. Well, great. I really appreciate your time, Glenn, and uh, this is a lot of great thinking that you, sh you can do uh, when you go out, and uh, some of the things that he has here would be easy for you to go pick up yourself and uh, prepare a kit for helping you uh, survive. Yeah, even if you don't like the idea of wearing a backpack, you can get a little kit like this and just clip it onto your belt or a waist pack, and it's kind of out of the way and, mm -hmm. and uh, very practical yeah, to carry. Yeah, it's not heavy. It's, it's not heavy at all. Good deal. Well, thank you, Glenn. Yeah. I appreciate your time. Okay.